So we're going to go ahead and, and, and start a panel, which we've done uh, uh, combinations of this panel in the past on the topics of, uh, I think you heard Lori mention horror stories about extreme scale computing in the morning. Um, and that's certainly one of the things that we can speak to panelists if you'd like to. That might be one of the first questions we, I open with here. The point really is for you all to have questions for panelists. So I might ask one or two to get the ball rolling, but I really like you all to ask questions. So uh, the very first question I'll ask each panelist, and, and by the way, I will set a timer on my, on my uh, phone. If you, hear, if you hear a pleasant sound go off, it's because you're, you're reaching one minute and 30 seconds, so we can give everybody a chance to respond. So my first question to each of the panelists, uh, can you comment on essentially the largest runs that either you or your uh, your students have run on your behalf in terms of total core counts or or any other metric that you might want to use that says how large they are? Start with you, Danya. Uh, all right. So we, we have run MFM on uh, the BGQ machine we have in Livermore, um, the million core counts. Million core. Yeah. Okay. And I'd like to up that two million. Okay. <laughs> we actually I should have said millions. Should have said millions. Eddie. It's all in your PR. He's working on it. So we were actually at a review and we'd hit the one million mark and somebody said, the machine's not loaded right now. And so we slipped in a two million core job assuming that it would never run because we'd never get the machine. And just before the, the presentation, we got our two million numbers. Um, that awesome. was once. Awesome. Once. Ulrika? Yeah. Okay, so we actually, um, I had a one and a quarter million, up to one and a quarter more on run on Sequoia um, mm -hmm. before it went classified and, right, so I was trying to, edge, I could have gotten more except for there was a mess up and then the machine went away. Anyway, so, um, so I got that, but I should say that we used um, OpenMP underneath and so we actually had four and a half million parallelism. So wow. just to tap wow. you to <laughs> it. <laughs> it's going up. Can you talk that, Mark? Wait, what's your definition? One and a half million. How many MPI what? processes or how many? Uh, I would say I gave cores. I didn't give MPI. Yeah, I right, gave so cores. Right, so many processes. Cores. Okay. Yeah, cores, but then I added threads underneath, so that's why. Oh, per core? Yeah. Oh, actually, many, yeah, that means actually cores. It's four and a half million, have. million cores, actually, yes. Huh? Okay. So, yeah. okay. That's true. How about you, Mark? So the, we never were able to get at the Livermore machine, so the biggest thing was the full mirror machine. Mm -hmm. but, so that's, what, three-quarter million cores uh, with uh, four MPI processes per core, so that's 3.1 million MPI processes. Wow, wow. Yeah. Hey, that was, it just went up across the, across the well, no, 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 no. We know you did, well, no. but no, actually we did not have that many cores. We had threads on an east okay. because, you know, oh. they have like. Well, no, yeah, but that's yeah. much better. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know. So that's why we had four and a half million on parallelism. Yeah, so that's yeah, why I'm saying that, that was, was peak there. Um, okay. Yeah, hardware threads, so. Okay. Yeah. But it was only one and a, um, yeah, <laughs> one and a quarter. Million. Which oh, actually leads oh, into the oh, obvious oh, observation oh, that there's no unique million. way to define parallelism. <laughs> oh. uh, uh, can you repeat that? Sure, suffice it to oh. say oh. that you, it's fairly large numbers and you have to be fairly scare, careful to get scaling at that level. Right. So, so one of the problems for the people who've heard about ECP, they, they want to measure progress. And so they want to say, well, you, you, you're doing 10 times more. And so one of the biggest debates has been, what does this mean? What does 10 times more? I can do a 10 times bigger run, but it's a new machine. So is that 10 times more cores? Is it 10 times more MPI processes? And actually, the, the metric I think they're using is fraction of the machine. So if the machine gets 10 times bigger and you do the same, no, let's see, yes. So if the machine gets 10 times bigger, then you get credit for being able to do 10 times more, assuming you can scale on it. But this is an issue that we're all facing is how do you count parallelism? Is it cores? Is it MPI processes? Is it MPI processes times threads? Do you count hyper-threading? Is it nodes versus cores? Well, now, how do you do hybrid machines? Because do GPUs count as a core? Do they count as a, you know, a if you're counting threads. a node, then how do you count different nodes relative to each other? Um, and I think we're, we're in the middle of a period where we don't know how to define that. Yeah, and it's going to get worse with GPUs and everything, right? Yeah, so then yeah. it's, well, going to. It's getting. It is. Yeah, yeah. right. Okay, so uh, having opened with that question, I have more questions in my pocket, which I, I'd prefer not to have to ask because I'd like each of you to ask questions uh, of uh, field experts here uh, uh, to, to ask questions about experiences in either getting to extreme scale or dealing with performance portability or dealing with heter heterogeneity in these architectures. So anybody want to venture a question? Over here. Mark, over there. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, question about heterogeneity. So since the new cluster is going to have multiple GPUs and some CPUs, do people uh, mostly going to target the GPUs and let the CPUs stay, sit there idly, or are they going to try and load balance the work, give the CPUs a small fraction of the work, knowing how much it's going to take the GPUs to finish the other fraction? Who, who, who would like to start answering that? I'm sorry. Yeah, Ulrika. so I, I can uh, say one thing about this is because especially working with algebraic multigrid methods, and I know we haven't talked about this yet, um, but uh, one of the things is there's certain algorithm parts of the method which are really hard to put on a GPU. So just based on this, there might be parts that we actually keep on the CPU because they will actually be faster on the CPU than on the GPU. Of course, we don't really know where this is going to go because who knows how fast the GPUs become. And, and maybe uh, things will get easier too to be able to use those accelerators because I'm assuming um, vendors will come up with different ways of doing it. But right now, so definitely there will be parts which will stay on the CPU for that reason. So, or if the problem is too small, you know, like multi grid methods, you get smaller, smaller, smaller. It's too small to be efficient on the GPU. You might want to keep that on a CPU, so. Any, anyone else? So um, I guess my take on this is, I, I, ideally, I think it will be great if you can think of the GPU and the CPU as just a, uh, one big heterogeneous machine where everything is weighted, the performance is weighted, the cost of communication is weighted, it's a huge MPI graph, and you just have heterogeneous MPI. That's not available. It doesn't seem like it will be available. Uh, so you mean being able to call MPI from a CUDA kernel? No, no, I mean, I mean starting with the domain decomposed problem for the whole heterogeneous, a heterogeneously decomposed problem for the whole machine. Ah, okay. And, and, and being, being able to put some data on the CPU, part of the data on the GPU. Uh, I don't think that's gonna happen because as Ulrika said, some algorithms are inherently not good to be on the GPU. So you can't really decompose all the data. It probably doesn't make sense. Uh, I, what I'm seeing is that right now most people are targeting just the GPUs, they have so many more flops. Um, the CPUs that we have are also quite good though, so I don't think it's, it's very wise to just leave that performance on the table. Uh, so this is still very much in flux as with everything else. Any other panelists? Mark? I might need more than my minute and a half. You can take one away from me for later. <laughs> Fair let, me, let me first start by saying what I work on is only a small piece of the calculation. But the way you ask the question, it's, oh, we're really just going to focus on the, the GPUs and let the CPUs sit. If I look at the, uh, uh, the machine at Oak Ridge uh, that has GPUs, it's sometimes the opposite. It's never been the, all the GPUs. That is, people use the CPUs and the GPUs sit because they're not easy to use. Right? If I'm doing linear algebra, I'm doing very specific thing where the, the computations are very dominant, well, then I'm really going to target that. I do mesh adaptation on unstructured meshes where I have to go through complex decision processes to change one element. Right? GPUs don't like conditionals. Right? So we have to stand on our head to do that. So uh, following up on what Zanio just said, we started off by, I not even wasn't even worried about the GPU then. I just want to go many core. Well, hell, I don't want to have to deal with two modes of parallelization. I don't want to thread an MBI. So let me just do my decomposition in two levels. I'll decompose to the nodes, and I'll decompose on the node. And I have different constraints on how I decompose on the node than between the nodes, right? I, I don't care as much about the communication. Wow, oh, great, go ahead and do that. <laughs> Increased performance, yes, but not great increases in performance. So all right, so now we have to trash our object-oriented data structures, which are very nice for things that are constantly changing, figure out how to do array-based data structures for our entire mesh database to be able to, uh, in, when I'm constantly changing. Array-based data structures for a mesh is fine when it's static. I'm never static. I'm constantly changing. Well, so we figured out a way to do that. Get pretty darn good performance, much better performance. But now we've got two different levels of parallelism, two different methods. 
Now it's time to do the damn GPU. Oh, you don't want me to do conditionals. Oh, you don't want me to do this. You don't want me to do that. So the, the solution there was to scrap how we even do the, you know, we had to already scrap our data structures to go to things that were to us unnatural. Now they're more natural to us. You're on your next minute. Okay. <laughs> then the, <laughs> the, now for the GPU, we have to scrap how we do mesh adaptation entirely. And we do all this work in advance to group all these things together and then put them in their independent sets and then send them down to the GPU where we know the stuff's already done. And now the array-based data structure, to hell with a array-based beta, uh, data structure that's flexible, we'll just load it down and blow the old one away, put the new one in its place because that's the only way to get performance on the GPUs. So bottom line is portability, I'm not going to get it between these different classes of machines very easily and, and, have, and have reasonable performance all we do. I'm going to have, probably have different algorithms on different machines to almost. Very, very complex problem. I, get to, I want to make one comment. Uh, response to that, the machine, I think, this is quick, Zanya, correct me if I'm wrong, or Ulrika, I think 90% of the peak flops on paper of that machine comes out of the GPUs. So if you right. choose to leave the GPUs on the floor, you're not going to get much out of that machine. Right. So, uh, question over here. Yeah, it's about the heterogeneity still, and it's related with all you know what you said before. But it's more like what what's your feeling in the future? Because this morning Jack Longara told us that the event-based is about you know it's what we should do an event-based approach instead of the bulk synchronous. And Magma can run on both. CPU and GPU at the same time, so apparently it's effective. Mm -hmm. What's your feeling? Is the event-based approach the future, or you don't see a future not even for that if we have to invent everything it's, from it's, scratch? It's things like magma and, and uh, cocos and that really work out, that's going to be great. I'm still not sure I'm not going to need to come up with different algorithms to do that, because, for example, to use cocos, I've got to... Uh, I can't do that with my current mesh adaptation. I've got to do that with the GPU-based one to begin with. Um, when you're looking at the specific part of matrix operations, I think those things are going to be wonderful for that. For the entire workflow, if that entire workflow deals with starting, in my case, from a CAD model and doing all the things, I don't know where, what they're going to do. I'm hoping they do more, but I, I, don't, I don't know at the moment. I mean, you don't see a future. No, no, I, 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 uh, no, no, I, no, we have no choice. That is, you know, that's what's going to be there. We're going to have to do what we can on them. I just don't know exactly what it's going to look like uh, in, uh, two years from now. Other panelists want to speak to that? Yeah. So, I mean, we've been trying to do some getting hyper started on GPUs. And so there are parts of it that you can speed up if you have a very big system. So that it really depends on the applications that actually use the linear solvers, how much room do they give us? That's been always a problem. If they put a lot of stuff into the memory for their physics and so on, there's not much room left for the <laughs> linear solver. And that's Sorry. it. I, that wasn't me, right? No, it wasn't. That was me. <laughs> that was Mark. Sorry. <laughs> that's oh, you still got time. <laughs> Anyway, uh, then, um, then we are out of luck, right, essentially, because then um, it might be even faster to just run this thing on the CPU. In this case, we will, not, we will leave the 90% lying there. But I should say, since we are working with sparse matrices, we always have been letting a lot of p potential performance lying around. We cannot use magma or anything like that, because a lot of these PDE-based um, systems we get, they're just sparse. So you don't have a dense system, like when Jack was running his stuff, yeah, great. If you have a dense system, you can do this, but we just don't. So yes, I think there will always be uh, situations even down the road where we will not be able to use all the performance. We just do our best. That's essentially that. And ultimately, still the goal is to get the time down as much as possible. Performance really doesn't matter that much. L less time, that's important for the user, I think. So, so I want to pick up on the asynchronous thing. So in the world of complex multi-physics, time-dependent PDEs, there's a lot of room for asynchrony. And so that can happen, so we think of it as two levels. There's one at the low level where you have chunks of work and you, you call it task-based or event-based. 
you're distributing that work in some sort of asynchronous way. You need to get it all done. You understand your dependencies. But it's a relatively low-level asynchrony that doesn't change your algorithm. But then you can get into some interesting things where you have higher-level asynchrony. We think of it as sort of a high, medium, and, and low level. Low level is something, it's under the covers, it's how you distribute tiles to threads or, or how you distribute things across the GPU, and that's just about performance. Then you have something where you have something, uh, fork join parallelism is one example, where you might want to do four diffusion solves. You're diffusing species in a combustion application. It might be more effective instead of doing them sequentially across the entire machine, you might want to do four solves at the same time across parts of the machine because you're, you want to use your resources in parallel. And then you can go to the level of algorithm asynchrony where, for example, if you're doing a self-gravity solve in a cosmology simulation and you're evolving something else about the state, you can do those at the same time. And so you can be doing one in the GPU, one in the CPU. There are a lot of I mean, you can think challenges versus opportunities. So the more complex your algorithm, the more space that in that you have to play with. It's not a one-size-fits-all, though. The, the concept that, yes, we'll, we'll just tell it, distribute it over the machine, use it optimally, We'd all be out of business if that happened. Um, but there, there are a lot of interesting places where you can change your algorithm to exploit the fact that maybe on a serial machine it would be slightly, fast, slightly slower, but it uses the parallelism well enough that you speed up dramatically. Sonia, you want to speak to that topic? Or? I, I just want to add a little bit to what Ulrika said. Um, when you speak about one package, it's easy to say CPU or GPU. But the reality of the big applications is you have 20 packages working together. It is very unrealistic. Everybody wants to be on the GPU if they are flop intensive. The memory there is not sufficient. So you may be forced to think of getting in and out of the GPU or maybe doing some of the computations on the CPU just because the problem is very big. Uh, and there are things like unified memory that automatically will do that. So I don't think it's a, I think the CPU is absolutely still here and will play an important role. But you have to take advantage of the accelerator somehow. Otherwise, most of the machine is, most of the potential of the machine is lost. Okay, other, other questions? Anyone else? I can, yes? Uh, so you want, it, you want it halfway, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, do you, what do you guys think about parallel and time methods? Parallel and time, anybody thinking of that? <laughs> Some of us, yes. So, so the answer is, I mean, th there's an obvious case for it, right? That we know how to do spatial parallelism. Time is the bottleneck. We have to take more steps. Um, so there's an obvious win if you can make it work. It works to some degree. I would say it's not, it's not the panacea that one would like it to be. There are different strategies for it. Some are better than others. It's a stepping stone. It's, it's one more incremental thing you can do. I'd say in some applications it's worth it, and some it's not. Other panelists want to comment parallel in time? Uh, I think you should I, 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 can, I can comment on that. Um, uh, so I, I guess I will rephrase what Anne said as um, there are a lot of interesting opportunities and research questions related to parallel in time. Uh, we, we have a project in, in uh, Livermore uh, called Braid, uh, which is actually uh, very closely related to the Hyper project. Uh, and it's a kind of black box parallel in time um, uh, algorithm where you only, the, the application provides the step function and it tries to do 1D multigrid basically in time. Um, for problems like diffusion, uh, where you have very well, um, very good control of the, uh, and understanding of the eigenvalues, uh, that work great. For problems like advection, especially if it's pure advection, it, uh, we don't understand it well yet. Um, it's really, um, it's, it's a tool, and it's a tool for specific cases. Uh, certainly on one processor, you don't want to do parallel in time. It's just too expensive. But if you have a very important problem, and it only takes 1,000 cores, and you have the whole machine, and you re really need the solution right now, uh, parallel in time can, can you know, give you some speed up, some significant speed up. But again, I, th I think it's important. The takeaway is its, its effectiveness is very dependent on the type of e what the equations are. Given right. the current level of research, yes. <laughs> yes. yes. We're, we're still doing research. I would say mathematically there are reasons why it's not going to be the panacea. Well, we can, yeah, we yeah, can yeah. argue about that. <laughs> <laughs> you want to argue now? No. no. We can argue, we'll argue later. <laughs> okay, other, other questions from, yes? 
Favorite pro programming paradigm, MPI plus X. Or least favorite. Or least favorite. Favorite or least favorite. I like that. Yeah. Comments? So I would say, okay, so MPI plus OpenMP is sort of the default right now, right? That's easily supported by a lot of the machines if you're not doing, well, the status of OpenMP for GPUs is something that, that I don't think I can speak <laughs> accurately to. Maybe somebody in this room can. So I think the, uh, the hope is that MPI plus OpenMP becomes a paradigm that can cross over between CPU and GPU. I think the verdict's still out. But I think so MPI plus X is a pretty standard. But the other one that's in play is this PGAS model. And that's something that in AMRX we're actually supporting at a lower level. And we're, we're basically going to continue development until we see whether it works. And then for those who don't know PGAS, it's partitioned global address space. And the idea is that instead of viewing it as here's a node and, and you have access you know, memory that's local to that node and you think of it as, as local, you have a global address space. And so instead of doing an MPI send and MPI receive, you just say, I want that value and it's as if it's flat. Um, that's the very cursory description. It's a model that has promise. We have seen speed ups with the PGAS. You, specifically, there's a UPC++ library that sits on top of it. Um, it's still a little bit in the research phase, I would say. We have seen places where it's an absolute win. Um, I think it's one of those things that the verdict's still out, just the same way that we don't know what, I would claim we don't know what the best GPU model is going to be. I don't think we have an answer to that yet. Eric? I'm done. Other, uh, anyone else want to speak to favorite or least favorite programming paradigm? Mark? No. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, there are the usual suspects, but one uh, that, that, that I particularly like and, and we're using in C is OCA for the, uh, so MPI plus OCA I think is actually a, a very interesting choice. Could you, I'm sorry, Zanyo, repeat the MPI plus what? OCA. Okay. Okay. I, I think you guys have heard from Tim Warburton already OCCA. about OCCA. OCCA. Okay, yes. all right, thank you. Okay, other, other questions? Uh, up there, yes. Uh, so what's the worst side effect bug you introduced in any code you wrote that you didn't expect at all to happen? Oh, worst oh, worst side it. effect that you wrote uh, that you didn't expect to happen? That's a difficult question. <laughs> None of us are going to admit that. <laughs> no, I'm sure I had some. I just can't think of any right now. We may have to come back can, to this. So, so, I, so, so maybe I, we should I, take I, some other questions yeah. first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can, think, I, can think of, I can think of an experience I had with that that I can, I can honestly say I didn't introduce, but I, I used another code that I downloaded off the internet to try to solve a problem. Your friend did it, right? Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> it was an interval arithmetic library. Uh, I won't mention the name of it, but I downloaded it. And, uh, and you was using it for some calculations within visit. And in fact, let me start the timer on myself, sorry. Um, and uh, uh, that time. library changed all the, all the results that visit was producing. We, produced, we do nightly tests numerically, slightly differently, some pixel differences in the image. I'm totally puzzled why this is happening. It takes me three days to debug it and I discover there are um, static initializer, class initializers that are, have pragma statements in them that are changing the process of rounding behavior. And I did not know this in this library. So simply linking to that library, not calling a single function in that library, totally changed the behavior of the application it was in. So that, that was frustrating and annoying. <laughs> Three days of debugging. Yeah. I would say one of the classic things in, in simulations that are inherently unstable is the order of operations. You know, if you change number of processors, you change the way you do things, it changes the order of operations. And when you're testing on, is it greater than one or something? You flip one bit and all of a sudden you've changed your answer and then that propagates ever so slightly and you finish a simulation, the answers are a little bit different. And it's n the amount of time you spend saying, was it really just that one order of operations? Because it's hard to go back and then force the order to be what it used to be. And I've done this to, to prove it to myself. But you always, there's that, that lingering doubt. Is there a bug there that I just haven't exposed or is it really just I flipped one bit there and then it triggered one different answer to, one different test came out differently. Um, we still have simulations where I'm just not 100% sure. And so, you know, it, it may be there's a bug there, I, <laughs> I still don't know. But that's one of the things that you start to live with. They talk about um, reproducibility of results. And it's a wonderful, wonderful concept and I dare anybody to have per perfectly reproducible code because while you slept, the compiler got updated. 
somebody slipped into pragma somewhere. <laughs> you know, I mean, th th there's just so many things that change, and we can have our codes be line for line identical. The environment they run in is not. And, you know, these things happen, and so the idea that you can get bit by bit precision reproducibly is, is kind of a hoax, and what do we do about that? So, not quite the answer to your question, but. So, sorry. Okay. So I, I, I remember one. Uh, I mean, I've, I've made a lot of bugs, but uh, this, this, this was a long, long time ago when I was a student. Uh, and, <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, I, I don't know, it was some complex simulation code, and I just didn't get it to converge properly and couldn't figure out what's going on. And um, it did, it turned out that uh, in the action of the operator, which was just a subroutine, you get and you get an X and Y, and given X, you produce Y. I was changing X. This is before, before const statements and, 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 and variables. And I was changing the input in a very subtle way because it was some, some the, the, action, the action involved solving things and it was complicated. And, and so it, it was supposed to, and, but I was assuming that it's constant. So the moral is, you know, uh, nowadays, you have nice languages where you can declare const uh, input parameters. Please, please do that. <laughs> it will save you a lot of, I mean, it took me a few days to find that. Const is your friend. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else? Okay. Can't think of there, Mike. Yes. Um, so I hear a lot of frustration from, from, from the people <laughs> doing talks. And I was wondering if you could share with us some strategies for coping with the frustrations inherent in your code having to change every 10 years, like Jack Van Geyer was saying this morning, or your architecture changing all the time and everything seeming to be in a constant state of flux. So strategies for dealing with change in, in, so, in, in software. I, I heard. And, and, and in people that are writing the software. I heard, so, yeah, anyway, go. I, I, I don't know why, I mean, um, frustration, really? Uh, I, 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 it depends how you look at it, right? Uh, I, I always feel of uh, I always feel like constraints and, and, and challenges uh, uh, make things more interesting. Uh, if that was not the case, then you know Gauss figured out how to solve linear systems hundreds of years ago. There is a very clear algorithm. It would be fine for everything we do, but it's not. Why it's not? Because we want to solve larger systems. Oh, because we want to solve them or supercomputers. If we didn't have to do that, the algorithm is clear. Now we want to solve them on GPUs. That means that the things that we thought we knew how to do before are interesting again. Uh, so I, I, I guess I find this actually challenging and interesting that things are changing. So Zanya's answer is change is fun. Well, it's an opportunity at <laughs> least. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's job security also. Yeah. True. Well, you can look well, at it that I, way. I think, yeah, I think you already said one of the things is change your mindset about this, right? Consider it an, a challenge instead of a frustration or whatever. Uh, if you really can't stop being frustrated, maybe you need a vacation. And then after you come back, <laughs> you feel better, right? Um, there's this. Or just go and have some beer and watch a movie or something. I don't know. Um, but but I, I, I sort of agree with Sonia when you actually finally deal with the fact that you just get over your first frustration that you actually have to do this and you start getting looking into it, then you find things that are actually interesting about it again. So that's my perspective on it, right? And so, so that's part of how to deal with it. I mean, part of it is just go and do it, right? But th there is the frustrating aspect of you've got to convince the program managers that, yes, we have to change, and by the way, it's not going to be overnight. It's going to take me three years, so send the funding for three years. That, that's the frustrating that's part. That's another part, yeah. Not doing the, the work isn't so, is not as bad as uh, convincing them. Yeah, the reality is I think we'd all get bored if it didn't change. I mean, it, it, it's a little flip, but you embrace it. And it's, to me, it's, so a lot of times when I'm talking to students and they're talking about what's it like, and I say, if you like jigsaw puzzles, then you'll probably like this. And there are times where that last piece is on the floor. Right, and that's the frustrating moment of you think you've got it all working and something's conspiring against you, but it, it is. There's, there's always new challenges and you, you make progress and you have setbacks and you move forward and then sometimes things work and that's the day you go home early and, and uh, have your beverage. And then you come back the next day to find out they upgraded the machine overnight and you start over and, and all that. <laughs> but it's, it's, I mean, I, the honest truth is I think we actually all like what we do and that's a piece of it and, you know, we, 
it's, it's important for the program managers who fund us to understand that we have to spend time changing things. Um, I think that's probably where the frustration is. It's just an acknowledgement that that's part of the job. So, so a follow-up to that real quick. To, to what extent do you think in uh, uh, technologies like continuous integration uh, systems, so I don't know, I'm thinking like combinations of GitHub and Travis or whatever, are, are helpful in that process or, uh, or you know, dealing, you know, uh, to, to what extent do the soft, does the software development process help you to deal with change? It's a requirement nowadays. There's no way to deal with you. So yeah. say that again, Mark? Pretty much a requirement to have those tools. Okay. We we couldn't keep up with things. We couldn't even we can't even write proposals without those tools today. <laughs> yeah. True. Well, but I mean, it's also really helpful to have those. You know, just the very fact that you keep testing these things, and so you can find bugs that get back in very quickly. And I mean, that makes really a big difference to be able yep. to do that. Yeah, you that's frustrating. Solving forever. the same thing three yeah. times. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> following up, you know, you guys have access to some amazing tools <laughs> that we didn't yeah, have we access to. Sure. And oh, come on, were. I had to use punch cards. You <laughs> didn't have to do that. I mean, GitHub. <laughs> Actually, I did, so. How, how amazing is that? You, 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 uh, you know, you can connect with people across the world. They will look at your code. They will, they will write pull requests. And then you have Travis automatically checking it on each pull request and have code coverage. And this, these are really, really useful things. And, and uh, uh, they help. I don't know if they help with the big change right. uh, mindset, but they certainly help with code productivity. So, so uh, I did see a hand go up in the back here, yeah. and I interrupt. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just had a question of, uh, just uh, about this more, I guess, specific question, but about the cut cells versus the finite elements. Like, uh, you guys compare and contrast some more of those? So cut cells versus finite elements. Any panelists want to comment? Ann, maybe? So, so I gave the sales pitch for cut cells. There are a lot of good reasons. I actually, there are also, so, so taking off my Amorex hat, there are, one. Of, there are a lot of compelling reasons for finite elements. I mean, I think it's a trade-off, and it's, there's a sense in which it's what do you like to think about, right? I personally don't like to think about the boundaries. I like to think about the physics that's happening away from the boundaries. So if I can have a regular mesh there, and then, okay, there's something special I've got to do over there, I'll do that. I find that the mesh people spend a lot of time thinking about the mesh. I don't want to think about the mesh. I want to think about the physics. I want to think about the interplay between the advection, the diffusion, the reactions. So there's a sense in which, I mean, you made the statement that, I can't remember what exactly was hard, but it's hard. I mean, these, these complex meshes, they don't make things easy for you. Your loops aren't quite as straightforward. Um, there, there's not a right answer. I mean, there, there, you can get good answers. You can get quality solutions with both approaches. Um, a lot of it is kind of what you grow up with, is the reality. Um, I will concede there are times when fine elements do a great job. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there is conservation of difficulty, and and you can kind of <laughs> uh, you can kind of now yours are harder. Uh, no, uh, uh, I think you can kind of gauge by what's uh, popular in different communities. I mean, there are certain industries that, that just pick one approach or another, and that's usually for a reason. Um, it, yeah, uh, it's, uh, it, it also depends what you, what you per personally are comfortable with. Um, but it very much depends on the application. Okay, I think we have time for just one more question. Go ahead. Uh, so with respect going to exascale, where do you see um, precision of the, num the doubles that we have right now go with respect to the increasing number of operations involved in solving a particular problem? So as you're saying as you get to, you know, exascale or beyond exascale, is double precision really going to continue to cut it, or do we need to go to quad? Well, I'm pretty sure it will not, but uh, so. Okay. okay. Panelists, do you have thoughts on this? About the cumulative error in, like, if we have an exascale machine and you continue to use 80% um, of 90% or 100% of that machine, then your calculation will potentially involve a lot, a lot, a lot of Error, like a lot of operations where the cumulative error is potentially getting beyond what we want to have with double right now. It's kind of interesting because a lot of us actually looking at reducing the precision to yep. be cheaper and faster and so on. So, so there's some part that's going the other way actually. So for, for right now, I don't see really us to going beyond double precision at this point, but 
there might be a time when this will be required, so I don't know. Yeah, just to actually follow up with that, there's a uh, compression library that I'm familiar with uh, called Z ZFP, which is a floating point compression library, which that's been used within some applications at Livermore. It, uh, ZFP is developed at Livermore, but it was, it's been used to demonstrate that those applications could probably, you can compress the output of these applications by maybe 64 to 1, loss, lossy, this is lossy, doubles, and still get out accurate results out of the simulation to within five decimal digits. What's that telling you about the simulation? Probably doing you know, much, much more work than it really needs to to get the answers out. Well, and that ties back. I think sometimes we deceive ourselves by saying, I'm doing it at double precision. This must be a really accurate result. <laughs> and then again, the order of operations, or you tweak one input, and you realize, you know, now I'm different in the second decimal place. Why was I worrying about the 15th? Yeah. So there are trade-offs there. Okay, I see we've just uh, gone down to zero on the clock, so let's thank our panelists. <laughs> <laughs>